Okay, here's the thing. For many of us, we've seen people talk about God or, or share about Jesus or share their faith. We've seen this done so very wrong. We have seen people be aggressive and, and condescending and mean and pushy and impersonal. We know we don't want to do that because one, that's not how Jesus treated people. And two, we at least like having friends. So we know if that's the only way to share about Jesus, then we know we don't want to do that. But just because we've seen it done wrong, doesn't mean we can't be the ones to do it right. My name is Hosanna Wong. When I was in my mom's belly, my parents started an outreach to people who were living on the streets in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco. Several days each week, my family would hold church services and Bible studies there at the park, handing out clothes and lunches and giving haircuts. Both sides of the park were occupied by hundreds of people battling addiction and recently released from prison or running away from something. To many, this was a dangerous destination where runaways and misfits strayed if they had no place to go. But to us, this is where we created a family. This is where we had church. Years later, when I'd meet other people who would say, hey, I also grew up in church, I realized we were not talking about the exact same thing. For some of us, because we're not sure how to do it or we feel so overwhelmed, we decide to give up altogether. And that is the perfect plan of how not to share the hope of Jesus with the world that desperately needs it. The first time I witnessed a murder, I was nine years old. I was sitting on brick steps with my three-year-old baby brother, Elijah, in a rundown public park in the inner city of San Francisco, California. I grew up in this park. On one side, it was covered by patches of browning grass, and the other side was covered with walls of faded graffiti. And there weren't any slides or swings like some parks have, but for us, this was home. One day in this park that felt like home, we heard hateful insults echoing between the city buildings, towering over me and my little brother. And the two groups of people faced off directly in front of us. Their words were some of the worst that humans could come up with, words that my brother and I had never heard before. And the first knife was pulled, and I couldn't even think to cover my brother's eyes, or my own for that matter. And another knife was pulled, and a group of people surrounded the scene, and I couldn't make out what was happening, except that small fights were breaking out all over. We heard sirens arriving to the scene, and people scattered, jumping fences, and fleeing the park. And as I stepped closer to see who was still fighting for their life and who was already gone, the police ran in, crowds blocked my view, and an ambulance took someone away. And our home would never be the same. I knew I had seen something I was not supposed to see. I looked at my little brother and felt a feeling I had never felt before, guilt. This was the first moment I remember feeling like I was supposed to save somebody, help somebody, do something more, but I couldn't. And my guess is you can remember too, one of the first times you saw something broken that you wanted to fix, or is someone hurting that you wanted to save. Maybe you too can relate to seeing things you were too young to see or hearing words that you were never meant to hear. Maybe you too can relate to feeling bad, that there was a situation you couldn't fix, or someone you love that you felt you didn't do enough for. The following weeks, I would think to myself, I should have picked up my brother and ran away. I should have screamed for help. I should have tried to break it up. I should have at least tried. I should have done more. And over the years, I'd try to do more. Throughout junior high and high school, I'd invite everyone on my basketball team to go to church with me and try to get involved in as many community service projects as possible. And I tried to do more, to save more and save better. But with every no, every rejection to an invitation, with every situation on my city streets not seeming to get any better, 
I was just left disappointed and the results left me insecure and angry. I grew angry at the people in my life that I couldn't help, angry at the circumstances I couldn't change, and angry at myself for being powerless to save people. I wanted to save the world from the pain I had experienced, from the brokenness I had seen. But how? How do we save when we feel powerless? Now, at an early age, I believed the lie that as a Jesus follower, it was now my duty to save everyone around me. But the truth, it's not any of our jobs to save. We were not created to carry the weight of everyone's salvation on our shoulders. It's actually amazing news that Jesus is the savior and we're not. We have the freedom to keep faithfully showing up for the people right in front of us, to have real relationships, share our real stories, and naturally talk about Jesus in our everyday lives without fear of what the end results might be. And it has taken me a long time to discover this truth. 10 years ago, I packed my life into suitcases and started traveling the country to share the story of Jesus through spoken word poetry. I learned this art form in the city park I grew up in and learned how to use it to talk about Jesus. Now, when I went on the road, I didn't have a plan or a home address and I went for years, and there was a whole lot of things I wasn't sure of. I wasn't sure how to love the people right next to me. I wasn't sure how to step into what God was calling me to do. I wasn't sure how to embrace community or even what I thought about the church. Put simply, I wasn't sure how to actually make Jesus known to real people. Living on mission for God, yeah, I wasn't even sure what that even meant. So I fumbled through it a lot. And I often got things oh so very wrong. And that's why I've written this study. It turns out I am an expert at how not to save the world. I've believed so many lies about myself, my calling, my purpose, and my story. I used to believe the lie that I had to do something impressive to do something important, that I had to have all the answers before I talked to anyone about Jesus. And maybe you've believed some of these lies too. Lies like my story can never help anybody, or I have to wait to have the perfect words or the perfect story or the perfect answers to ever show anybody God's love. And it'd be better if I just said nothing at all. And these are all lies the enemy hopes we believe so we are held back from being who we are created to be and living as we've been called to live. The truth is that there is a way for every person you know to realize how loved they are by God. The truth is that the details of your life story, who you are, what you like and don't like, and all that you've been through are exactly what God wants to use throughout these five sessions. We're going to crush the lies that have held us back and together, we're going to dive deep into what God's word actually says about revealing his love in today's day and age. We're going to reignite hope within us for those who don't know God. Today, we're going to talk about sharing God's love through our real relationships. Jesus was constantly making friends with people before they changed their behaviors. Before they chose Jesus, Jesus chose them. We see this in Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Now, it's important to note that back in the day, these weren't just guys that collected taxes. They were people who were snakes and snitches and traitors who were taking more money than they were supposed to, even from their own family members. They were turning their back on their own people for their own gain. And Jesus says to Matthew, follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. In fact, throughout the Gospels, we're going to see Jesus do this over and over again, making a bunch of friends with people that others would say, hey, there's no point in being friends with them. We see in Luke 19, a guy named Zacchaeus, who was also a tax collector, a trader, with a terrible reputation, who was up in a tree. We don't have time to get into all of that right now. It's a whole thing. But Zacchaeus is up in a tree, and Jesus sees Zacchaeus, and he says, Zacchaeus, get down from there, because I'm going over to your house tonight. And we're going to have a meal together. Jesus was known for the relationships he had, and he wants us to be too. How would our world look differently if we saw the call that came from God, the call to love like Jesus and live like Jesus? What if we saw it not as a cold, rigid mandate to convert, but rather as a beautiful commission to go and make and start and invest in and continue real relationships? Now, for some of us, we might think, well, friendships don't lead people to Jesus. We can't just go ye therefore make a bunch of friends. We have to preach the gospel. We have to share scripture. We have to preach the good news. And that's fair. We will get there. But first we must start here. Because why would the people in our lives believe us that the God we're talking about wants to know them if we don't even want to know them? If we are not careful we will self-righteously aim to save the world while skipping knowing the exact world we claim we want to reach. Instead, remember this, the call to be like Jesus is not a call to save, it is a call to serve. I wanna share with you one last story today. Her name was Mrs. Lee. She was the wife of a dentist in her 60s, and one evening she was doing her chores like she did every evening, and she heard a knock at the door, and she went to answer. And there was a young boy standing there asking if he could sell her a vacuum cleaner. I don't know if you knew this, but door-to-door -door salesmen were the original Instagram influencers. They did it first. They showed you the box, showed you how to open it, they got it done. She bought a vacuum cleaner from him. She invited him into her house, invited him to her dining room table. They sat across from each other, and she asked him about his life. How does he spend his days? What's next for him? And he was hesitant at first, but then he answered. He said, you know, I've been a heroin addict for over 15 years. I fought in a Chinese gang. I have bullet holes alongside my cab from the last time I ran from the police, from the last time I robbed someplace. And I'm pretty sure I can never turn my life around. And Mrs. Lee responded with no shock. And she spoke with no shame. And instead of highlighting all the ways that their lives were very different, and there were many, she instead highlighted what they had in common. And she said, you know what? I've spent years of my life trying to fill a void too, trying to figure out who I am too. And I've gone to all the wrong people and to all the wrong places to define me and tell me who I am, but then I found Jesus. And Jesus has changed my whole life and he has filled that void for me. And I'm not doing this perfectly, but as I'm continuing this ongoing conversational relationship with him, I'm becoming a little bit more like him. I think I'm becoming a little bit more like myself. And I have found the answer to our shared question. Do you want the answer to our questions? Do you want to be healed and whole? Do you want Jesus? And he said yes. And it wasn't a super spiritual or public moment. It was a simple prayer and a salesman on one knee and a cold dining room floor. But in that moment, he gave his whole life to Jesus Christ. And Mrs. Lee didn't know on that ordinary day when she was doing her everyday chores that five years later, that boy would grow into a man that would end up planning an outreach to those living without homes and battling with addictions on the streets of San Francisco and would end up seeing hundreds and thousands of people come to know Jesus throughout his lifetime. And Mrs. Lee did not know that over 30 years after that, I'd get to be here telling you about the day she led my dad to Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if Mrs. Lee ever led someone to the Lord before that time, and I don't know if she ever did after that, but I know she opened the door for this one man, this one time. And my whole life is different because of that. And after hearing the story of Mrs. Lee, 
it just changed everything for me because up until that point, I had seen my dad do all these public, extraordinary things in the park we grew up in, the park we grew up having church in. He had this extraordinary story and he was praying over people and people were coming to know Jesus there on the streets of San Francisco. Like he'd pray over someone and like 10 years later, they'd come back like a deacon in a church. Like, say what? An owner of a woman's home, a father, a mother, a renewed soul. I know he's led more people to Christ than I will ever know. But because I grew up seeing that, I grew up believing that I had to do something big to do something important. I believe I had to do something impressive to do something impactful. And it turns out that is a lie the enemy wanted me to believe. So I did not see the value of loving the people who were right in front of me. And perhaps that lie has stopped you too. Don't give the enemy any victory. Mrs. Lee gives us an example of how as we go about our everyday lives, we can be aware of the people crossing our paths. Mrs. Lee opened a door, She sat at a table and she told the truth. She made an invitation, she had a conversation and shared her own story without the pressure of what the end result might be. Friend, how can you and I reveal God's love in our everyday lives? We too can make invitations, have conversations and share our stories without fear of the end results we can be known for our authentic relationships. Just like Jesus, we can be with people right where they are. So many people in our lives don't even have a frame of reference for what it would be like to have a relationship with someone who is just with them and for them and listens to them and believes them. And one of the best things we can do to show God's love is to show people what he's like. And we can do that. Every day of our lives is an opportunity to make someone feel seen and known and loved. Over the next few sessions together, we are going to look deeper at other lies we believe that hold us back from sharing God's love with others. Today, let's think about this. Who is one person God has put right in your path that you can show his love to this This is Connie. He's protecting me on these streets for all her life. Decades. All her life. Even though I can fight for myself. Yeah, but you don't have to. You <laughs> Come don't on, have to. somebody. You represent the whole city of San Francisco. <laughs>